Hey everyone, welcome to another super data science video on self-organizing maps. In the last video, we talked about an introduction to self-organizing maps. So today we're going to continue on that, build upon it. But first, we're just going to take a quick review. Then we're going to get into the main part of the video, which is hyperparameter tuning. In hyperparameter tuning, I'll introduce the quantization error and how we use that in Bayesian optimization with the help of the hyperopt package in Python to actually do the tuning, and it's going to be great. All right. Cool. So last time we left off with the same data set, the breast cancer data set from Scikit-Learn. It consists of physical properties of labeled malignant and benign tumors. The whole purpose of this notebook is to isolate those tumors and separate them into clusters by using self-organizing maps. First, we need to uh, import all of the necessary packages. I have some necessary data science packages, NumPy and Pandas, a few packages for exploratory data analysis, uh, Seaborn Mat Matplotlib, and also the main package is Minisum, which will uh, allow us to create our self-organizing map models. Import that. We also load our data. And after loading all our data, we can start to visualize them. Uh, it's very important for data scientists to start out with using the head method just to check out the data. And by the column names, you can see that they're all just physical properties of the tumors. And you can see their shape, uh, the shape of the data, 569 observations and 30 uh, features, 30 dimensions, which I consider high dimensional and a, a great application of self-organizing maps. The target key, the zeros are malignant and the ones are benign. Let's just remember that because we're going to use that to label our points uh, with different colors and shapes so that we can identify them on the map. After loading data, it's always important to do exploratory data analysis. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of my favorite visualizations. First is probably my favorite is the disk plots from, uh, from Seaborn. It shows you the distributions between variables and you can plot multiple variables in the same, same plot. Just make sure that your x-axis shares the same unit uh, between your features. Uh, for, so here is the mean radius and the worst radius. Those are both units of distance, so it's OK to put them together and compare their distributions. Uh, this is great for presentations, by the way. So if you ever do a presentation at work, um, just please show the distributions. Uh, it'll do wonders. All right. Uh, second visualization I like is correlation heat map. First, you take correlation of all your features, and then you can uh, put them in a heat map. And you can easily visualize how the features are related. Now, correlation doesn't mean causation, but it's a great branching off point. Uh, the color bar is on the right. The, the darker color means negative correlation, and the brighter means positive correlation. Uh, I included the target, uh, which is the malignant and benign tumors. Zero is malignant and one is benign. So when you see that there is a negative correlation between the mean radius and the target, that means that the greater the mean radius, the greater the chance of the tumor being malignant. All down these rows, there are dark colors and good associations between features and the target. Uh, a few of them you can probably ignore, like the mean fractal dimension is only 0 0.013. That's no correlation. Um, but anyway, this video is about self-organizing maps, and that's what we're going to talk about next. In the heat map, we see how the different features relate with each other, and not really how different observations relate with each other. It's the opposite with self-organizing maps, because we take the high dimensional uh, features. In our case, it's 30 dimensions in the input layer. We condense them down to two dimensions in the output layer, uh, the two dimensions in our case being the, the x and the y axis. And by condensing down to two dimensions, we can easily see how close um, that observations are to each other, and we can cluster them accordingly. We'll start creating our self-organizing map with the same hyperparameters that we used in the last video. The hyperparameters are 30 rows and 30 columns. The input length is just the number of dimensions that we have, which is 30. The sigma is 1, learning rate at 0.5 at 100 iterations. 
let's just run that and we're going to get a pretty good clustering anyway um, we use the minisum class from the minisum library in putting our respective variables and uh, right after creating our class we need to initialize the self-organizing map with random weights uh, just by running this line. All right, so we've initialized our sum. Now we need to train with 100 iterations. You can choose however many iterations you want. I think 100 is good. It takes less than a second to train, one second almost exactly. And using this code, we can visualize a heat map containing all of our neurons in the rows and columns in those cells. The clusters are, are pretty decent. They're really good actually for no hyperparameter tuning. Uh, one thing to note is that the wider that the squares are, then the greater distance that the neurons are apart from each other, and that the darker they are, the closer they are. There's a section here that's very white. It signifies that these points are far away from each other. And there are sections that are pretty dark, meaning that the points are close to each other. Let's move on to hyperparameter optimization. Um, touching on the hyperparameters again, uh, sigma, I don't think I mentioned, is the spread of the neighborhood function. It affects how, the, how quickly and how, by how much the neighbor, neighboring neurons will learn through each iteration of training. The quantization error is the average distance of the sample vectors to the cluster centroids, aka the neurons. And it's very similar to the Euclidean distance. In fact, it's the same principle. In Euclidean distance, you can have the difference between the neurons or a neuron and an input. And that's the same case with the quantization error, except it's always just the input subtracted by every single neuron and then taken the entire mean of that, and you get your objective value to minimize the quantization error. And by changing our hyperparameters, we'll be able to minimize it. One quote I found while doing research is that the quantization error declines as the map becomes larger. So as x and y increase, uh, quantization error QE will decrease. And that means that we can't use the quantization error to compare maps of different sizes. And that's why I'm going to uh, keep my x and y's the same and not optimize them. And luckily, I found a heuristic from a paper that came out in 2005 that says that um, your x should be the square root of 5 times the square root of the rows of data. And I'm going to match my y along with that. And it's just going to end up being uh, 10 columns and 10 rows. Hyperopt is a library that I talked about that does Bayesian optimization. We'll get a little more in detail about what that is later. Uh, I'm just importing it up here. And I also condense the training code and the plotting code down to a couple of functions just to make everything flow more smoothly. In this box, I'm going to set hyperparameters that I know won't give a good result and plot. We don't see a lot of clustering here. What we see is each neuron kind of has uh, the different labels next to each other. We see overlapping here, and we also see that every single square is filled up, which means that everything is spread out pretty evenly. Nothing is distinguished here. And this is a pretty bad clustering visually, and you'll be able to tell by the contrast later when we improve the model, like just how good it's going to get. Um, and Sheldon was speaking here earlier. I included this photo just because Bayes' theorem is there. And I thought there was a little bit of Sheldon missing from the presentation. Anyway, let's focus on tuning sigma first by reducing the quantization error by using the function hyperopt.fmin. This function comes from the hyperop package and it minimizes an objective function given a space of features to manipulate. The algorithm is here and 
Uh, for further reading, I, I'm providing this link. It'll take you to this page by uh, written by a man named Thomas Hugeskins, and uh, it goes into a lot of detail. I'll include the link below in the video. Uh, if you're interested, uh, please go and learn more about it. Uh, so the structure of the fmin function is is like this. It will return the tuned hyperparameter, but first you need to include an objective function. The objective function that I want to include is a quantization error for the reason that we talked about. If you reduce it, you, you will get a better cluster in your self-organizing map. The quantization error is a method in the minisum package, but I converted it to a function just by using a converting it to a lambda function, lambda sig, and then the sig is a variable that will get passed into here and be manipulated in order for this entire lambda function to be minimized, in order for the quantization error to be minimized. The second parameter is space, and the function HP uniform works like this. You've, you give it a name that's equivalent to the name of your variable, so here it's sig and sig, and then you give it a starting position and an ending position. I did x divided by 2.1 because sigma cannot be greater than half of x or half of y. It's just a rule. Sorry about that. I had to do some digging on this algorithm. I found a paper, actually, that looks interesting. Uh, I'll read it some more later. Uh, but algo is a search algorithm, and there are some different types, and this is the recommended search algorithm. Uh, I'll also link this page uh, down below if you're interested in learning about, more about every single parameter in uh, Hyperopt. Anyway, I'll evaluate this uh, function 200 times, and uh, we'll see what we get in terms of sigma. And while it trains, I just want to bring attention that our learning rate is at 5 right now. I set it at 5, that's very high, and I, I doubt we'll get very good clustering, but it, it will for sure be better than what we had previously, which, as you recall, there were no clusters, essentially. Okay, it took 24 seconds to train, and we get a new sigma of about 2.7. Um, let's update our sigma values. Just a reminder of our new hyperparameters. Again, we still have a learning rate of 5, which is very high. Uh, train, that was quick. And plot. All right. Now this is drastic improvement. There are isolated values. Uh, when we don't see overlaps, that's good. That means that the values are clustering close together. One shortcoming of this method of visualization is that we don't know how many different inputs are in the same square. And one thing that I, I want to do is maybe use Plotly package or Bokeh to try to create an interactive self-organizing map. Uh, maybe that'll be my next video. I'm not sure yet. Um, I think it'll definitely be fun, but it could be harder than I imagine. Anyway, a lot better clustering here. The next thing to do is to optimize the awful learning rate, which is at five, very high. To optimize two variables, we need to input them into a dictionary called space. You can call it whatever you want, but I'm calling it space, just be consistent. And to import a couple of more uh, functions, trials and status OK. And then follow this format. You create a function. Uh, in this case, I created the sum function, inputting the space dictionary containing all the hyperparameters that I want to tune, and generate a value. And again, I'm using the quantization error method. And sum fn will return the loss value and also the, the, the status, which I assume if the status is not OK, that tells it to stop training. Uh, I'm not sure, honestly. Um, if we initiate a trials function, then we'll be able to print the trials and see the loss every single time through every iteration. Now sigma is changed to around 5, and the learning rate is drastically reduced from 5 down to about 0.2. Um, let's update our hyperparameters again and run the training. All right, the model is done training, and I think the separation is much better now in the top left. 
you see all those greens those are the the benign uh, tumors and the, the reds are the malignant ones uh, still I think one shortcoming of this visualization is that you can't tell how many inputs are stacked on top of each other which is why I think uh, some kind of interactive, interactive self-organizing map would be so useful and I, I'll really look hard into that seeing if I can make that in a future video. In conclusion, we see on the left before our tuning that the data were just scattered everywhere. There were no visible clusters. Um, after our tuning on the right, we see some significant clusters, uh, market improvement there. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that sometimes when you're not getting good clusters, but you think that your parameters are in tune, just try again. Because remember that when initializing self-organizing maps, uh, the, the weights are random and that can affect your your clusters uh, in the future. So sometimes you'll get lucky with your randomized weights. One technique to try to circumvent that issue is to use PCA on your weights. Um, and I haven't done that. And we haven't done that in the video, obviously. Um, but maybe in the future, we'll do that and see what kind of effect that PCA analysis has. Anyway, I hope you learned something about self-organizing maps and um, even exploratory data analysis, like I think those charts, all these charts are very powerful in presentation. They're each unique. Um, and all I can ask is that you learn something and that you enjoy the video and that you'll come back next time for whatever video I'm doing. Um, thank you. Till next time.